Let's do this. Bannon. Now I know, I know what I'm thinking and I know where we're going to go with this. Um, this, the overview for anybody and Robert, you'll, you'll add the details if I've forgotten anything. Um, Brian Colfage, a, a, a triple amputee war veteran, war hero, uh, started this GoFundMe page, a GoFundMe campaign. It was in 2018 called, uh, we build the wall or we will build the wall. It was a GoFundMe campaign. The goal of which was to raise a billion dollars to give to the government to crowdsource the building of the wall. Yeah, it was um, originally called We Fund the Wall. We Fund the Wall. Sorry. So there's two, there's two names and We Fund the Wall. We'll call it the GoFundMe versus the 501. Um, I, from what I understood, it started as not a gag necessarily, but as a political statement. Uh, mm -hmm. It took off like wildfire within, I think it was a week. They had over $23 million in donations. Um, from what I understand, they, disc they realized that they're never going to get to a billion dollar goal as stated on the GoFundMe uh, campaign which means that they would end up having millions of dollars either stuck in that account or refunded when it became clear they wouldn't achieve that goal. So they wanted to, um, they incorporated a new 501c4, which is a not-for-profit organization. And then they wanted to roll over the money that they raised into it. GoFundMe said, you can do that if you get everybody's express consent. And so everybody had to expressly, explicitly opt in to having their initial contribution in the initial campaign rolled over into the 501c4. 93% of the people did it and they ended up with over $20 million that was now transferred into this non-for-profit, not profit organization. When they initially started the campaign on GoFundMe, Colfage said, I'm not taking a penny, no salary, no compensation, no nothing. Uh, we're doing this all to build the wall. It's all 100% of it is going to go to the wall. When they were putting out the video to announce the transformation of the campaign. They needed everyone to opt in. Colfage reiterated these initial comments and the 93% of the people who opted in did so ostensibly on the basis of these warranties and representations and on the, you know, because they wanted to be part of the campaign nonetheless. Now there've been, four of them have been indicted. Colfage, Steve Bannon, who got involved as an, as a, involved in the day to day, and the indictment basically says that they defrauded the charity and the donors because 100% of the proceeds did not go to the wall. A million went to a, a separate not profit that Bannon had set up from which funds were diverted allegedly to Colfage by way of remuneration, monthly salary, other expenses to Bannon, et cetera. That's pretty good on the facts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the uh, additional context I'd put in is that when they launched the fund the wall, it was sort of political outrage at the time amongst uh, the Trump base at the fact that Democrats and the Republican Congress was not authorizing funds to build the wall, and so that that's sort of the backdrop. And it took off, and it was always originally intended as a political statement. So the original goal was just to show, let's show you how s serious people are about seeing the wall built to the Republican base, to the Republicans in Congress, by showing you how much money they're willing to give, give just give directly to the government to see it happen. So it was always a political statement. They knew they weren't going to raise a billion dollars. They knew that was impractical. But their point was to show, let's show you how significant this is. So it took off. The left were, and the media were outraged at this, and they attacked it on uh, in mass. And they put go, the reason for the whole transfer was the the media's first attack was you can't do it you, you you can't give any money to the government you're not allowed to that's not that's against the law you're not allowed to give the government money to do something uh, the government apparently can only take it from you well, that's another political point for another day the so they realized that their premise was not going to hold up in terms of actually being able to deliver the money to the government their goal was just again pol publicity political stunt create action force action show how consequential this is. And so then the media put huge pressure on GoFundMe saying, you know what, this is a bogus GoFundMe because they can't do what they're saying they're going to do. So GoFundMe was going to just refund all the money and block all of the, all future efforts to do build the wall campaigns on GoFundMe. They pushed back and said, look, our people are very committed. So uh, we want to give them an opportunity to continue to make the political point, uh, but we'll set it. But if you won't let us use GoFundMe, fine, we'll set up something else and use it that way. And originally, Go and GoFundMe thought they'd come up with a perfect way to kill it because this was just a big scam. Nobody really believed this nonsense. People had been suckered into giving the cash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People giving the money knew exactly what they were doing. That this is one of the, the lies that's in the Bannon indictment by omission. 
the uh, so then so they and what what GoFundMe was shocked by was that ninety three percent of the cash, ninety three percent of the people opted in. They thought they would never opt in. Now, often people don't respond to those emails. Often they get disappear. Often they vanish. They were completely shocked that that occurred. Uh, and so then the second wave of criticism took place, which said, well, because they decide, hey, we'll shift it. We'll try to build it ourselves. We'll see how much of it we could build ourselves just to keep the issue in the public discussion, the public debate, show the Republican base how many people are so deeply committed to just this issue having happened that we'll do what we can. It was always to be a political statement. So everybody opts back in. They end up actually, and then they get massive numbers of legal obstacles. People try to pre people try to prevent them from being able to build the wall, use environmental permitting issues, every other kind of issue they can possibly do to preclude them from doing it. They still succeed at actually building parts of the wall on the border, which everyone said they couldn't do. In this time frame, you have Colfage uh, making statements that were your classic exaggerated statements of fundraisers. But what I'll do for people that the most important part of the Bannon indictment is not what's in it, it's what's not in it. And there's three things to understand about what's not in it. One is the context for the wall that I just discussed, which is that everybody giving was doing it for a political statement and knew that. Second uh, is that the knowing the background of how the fundraising industry works, that the, the norm uh, and the third aspect is what's missing specifically from the indictment from a trial perspective. So on the first aspect, it's that background. Everybody knew they were giving it for political purposes to make a political statement. They were thrilled that things got done that everybody said they couldn't do, which was actually build part of a wall. The, um, that, that, uh, so that's the political backdrop in general of the story that it's mostly omitted from the, uh, from the discussion. The second part, and also in that capacity, uh, the, the number of statements, they're very loose in the indictment with when statements were made who heard those statements, and whether anybody actually gave money in response to those statements, which is the massive giveaway. Um, the, it appears we have another victimless crime, just like the NRA case. The Southern District of New York, did it, I guarantee you, if they had somebody, even one person anywhere in the country who said they only gave the money because they thought not a penny would go to anything other than physical wall construction, they would have put them in the indictment. I've done plenty of these fraud cases. I've watched and studied many more. They always include four or five most sympathetic victims right up front in the indictment. Sometimes they keep them Jane Doe and John Doe, but often not because they're usually going to be witnesses at trial. So you want that maximum level of empathy, maximum level of sympathy, completely missing from the indictment. So the so that's a backstory of, of what was going on with Build the Wall. The second part is background of fundraising campaigns. Here's If this indictment is held up, you could indict 90% of charities in America. You could indict every single political campaign in America. You could indict the Trump campaign and everybody part of it. I'll give you an example. They send out all kinds of incentives for people to give. They say, if you give now, we'll, Donald Trump will personally match this five times, six times, eight times, 10 times, different things. There's almost no way for them to track when you make the donation, whether that was the response to it. And I can pretty much guarantee you, he's likely not matching dollar for dollar each one of those people who gave in. According to the Southern District of New York, that's now wire fraud and 20 years in federal prison and forfeiture of your entire campaign fund. Uh, almost all fundraisers do this. The, now, I have told people in a wide range of contexts to be extremely careful about what you say if you're in a politically controversial arena anywhere in your business. They often don't follow my advice uh, because uh, it's just that it, it, it's the natural exaggeration of a salesman. The, under this theory, if you make any statement that they can show is not technically true, uh, even if it has nothing to do, in fact, with the transaction, that's the critical part here, then uh, they can indict you for it. Well, I can indict every car salesman in Las Vegas tomorrow for that. They're going to well, say something to me that's an exaggeration. That, I mean, so that's, that's, the, I mean, that's the problem. And this is, what, incidentally, one of my problems with charities in the first place. And it's why I go to Charity Navigator to see how much the CEO of any given charity is paying themselves. I don't care if they disclose it. Um, it makes it legally different, but if they disclose it and they're making half a million dollars a year, like some are who I won't name, that, I mean, that's, that's offensive enough to me on its face. So the, the fact that there are worse charities out there, not to name a big one in particular, uh, that have never been investigated as far as I know, certainly not indicted is one argument. That's, that's going to go back to the unequal application of the law. Mm -hmm. My problem is that 
and I see a lot of comments of people saying, well, I don't feel defrauded. I gave knowing, et cetera, et cetera. That's also a separate argument. The bottom line is, I imagine all they need is one or two or a handful of people who say, I didn't, you know, want my money going to Colfage's boat or whatever it was and his, you know, these things. Um, so these are fraudulent misrepresentations to induce people to donate, even assuming and taking for granted the vast majority, if not, you know, almost everybody knew what they were donating to and didn't care if Colfage drew a salary, in which case just make it transparent and say, okay, he will be drawing a salary. If you have a problem, whatever. And in Quebec, we have a term that's called bon dole, which is like good good trickery or good foolery. Like, yeah, the salesman exaggerates. It's the best car on the market. Uh, and I know that this, you know, Kofaj got into it. He says, all of it's going to go to the wall, all of it with an asterisk, meaning, yeah, we're not, nobody's going to go out of pocket here. We're not going to, we're not going to invest our lives uh, to do this. So it's, you know, all of it goes to the wall. Obviously expenses are, are not going to go to it, but you don't say that. And then, you know, does it become a crime in every other case? It probably not because most other charities are going to say, well, we have an 80% return or we give 60% and the rest of 40 goes to operations. And you could see our operations on our, on our spreadsheet. The question is going to be then, you know, like, was that done here and <laughs> why conceal what the expenses were and, 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 and why not disclose them right off the bat and be transparent to avoid this knowing you're going to be the object of even more scrutiny than you've ever been in the past. Yeah, I mean, and, and, there's, and I'll get to some of those aspects. The uh, but I think, but the core is the backdrop of what would be normal. Because the other thing, this really isn't like a charity. I know they set up a five hundred one c four ultimately to process things, but this is really a fundraising campaign, uh, really like a political campaign. And so I see that as a distinction. So it's not like United Way, which has this specific set of outlines. And by the way, a giveaway, which I'll get into more detail in the third step. The fact there's not a single allegation of violating charity laws, of which there are many, is highly insightful about where I think this case likely the evidence actually goes. It's one of the huge things that was glaring that was missing from the indictment that should be there if the case is what the government was saying it was. But going further, just the backdrop for people that know, the norm for fundraisers in political campaigns like this is they get at least 20% of everything that's raised. That's the norm. Like, for example, YouTube promotes Super Chats, right? Does YouTube disclose that they take 30%? Not really. You'd have to dig in to find that. Is YouTube defrauding all the Super Chatters? There's some people that might be agitated if they found that out. The, right, they, uh, people ask it all the time, and I had to look it up before I knew what it was. And yeah, I mean, true. I think there's just an example. Things, but the, but it, it's good to just know the broader context. So the broader context or background of what's normal here because it reminds me a lot of the bogus prosecution brought in Manhattan against the Abacus Bank. Good documentary uh, about that, where they're trying to set up the Abacus Bank as a fall guy for Wall Street fraud. And I'll get into something else about Southern District of New York in a minute, but the uh, uh, about who they charge and who they choose not to charge. But the so understanding the backdrop that the norm, the norm would be for a fundraising campaign is that the people involved in the marketing, just the fundraising side of it would take 20 percent off the top. Then there's at least another 5% in payment processors. For example, by definition, his 100% promise couldn't be true because GoFundMe took a percentage of the funds. So the you know that alone, under that definition, was he committing a crime by not disclosing that GoFundMe took 2.5%, 3%? That's why I ask people to play out the consequences of the theory they're pursuing here. They're trying to say if you make any kind of statement that could be possibly interpreted over here as, as untrue, then magically you've got a crime and we can forfeit all your money and put you in prison for 20 years. There's big, big problems with where they're going with this because of who, who it would drag in to the net. of uh, These you know, fraud cases are, I, try to, I, I deliberately lie in a material way that changes your conduct. The the and we'll get to they actually don't have that here is my view. We'll get to whether they, the the uh, aspects of that. So that's a broader context, so people can know the norm. Normally, if it, there's a twenty five million dollar fundraising effort, the people involved in the fundraising get paid five million just for the fundraising. That doesn't include all the administration, which became a nightmare here because they were being attacked politically and legally all across the spectrum in ways they never anticipated. 
Colfitch's background is doing all these little fundraising campaigns for political active causes. That's what he does. He's a triple amputee, one of the few people to even physically survive the, 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 what he went through in military con combat. That's why a lot of people are sympathetic with him. I have no doubt that Bannon is extremely sympathetic to him. Um, and he was also doing a lot of these activities. I'll give you one quick backdrop before I get into what's missing from the indictment as to what I think the real story is. If you know Steve Bannon, you know that his weakness is administrative organization. His strength is idea creation. He's an ENTP personality type of people want to look up Myers-Briggs. If I wanted to go after a guy like Bannon, I would find an administrative screw up that he's made. Tax, accounting, finances, that's exactly where I would go. Because the guy is the guy hasn't met a barber in 20 years. He gets his fashion advice from people on Skid Row. I, I, I mean, I, I, I admire the guy in many respects disagree with him on certain things. Uh, but the, but the, I, he's, I've known a lot of personalities like this. Think sort of Jerry Lee Lewis, nutty professor. This is a guy that, you know, he walk into his office and nothing's going to be even vaguely close to organized, but he'll insist like Bill Murray and Ghostbusters that there's different degrees of clean. So don't worry about laundering the clothes that that's who Steve Bannon is. So his weakness and it was a the big mistake they made here, aside from trying to hem in the people who love to overstate and exaggerate when they get excited because they're salesmen. Uh, it, but of course, stopping that is stopping human nature, in my view. Uh, the it, it, but you know, never say a hundred percent ever. I've told people that in a whole bunch of different contexts. They'll say 100% refund rate, 100%. I was like, that guarantees you trouble because the ability to technically comply is going to be non-existent. Uh, and so I always tell people not to do that. But calling it fraud and criminal to the degree that we're going to put somebody in prison for 20 years is a whole different animal. The But as to Bannon, it would not surprise me uh, that Bannon has multiple projects. One, the idea that Bannon would do this to make money is nuts. The uh, Scott Adams pointed out that's highly unlikely to be true. Well, so, now I don't, I don't want to fight with Scott Adams on, on Twitter. And a lot of people are saying, and you know, he's worth 55 million or 20 million, whatever he's worth. He's worth a lot. He doesn't need the money. Why would he do it? So I mean, that that's a superficial argument, just in the sense that a lot of times, you know, people do things not because they need to, but because they can. It's a question of power. It's a question of hubris. It's a question of not caring, thinking you're above the law. So the, the, the worth, Bannon's worth is a non-issue for me. There's plenty of people who are rich that steal. Winona Ryder got caught shoplifting. You know, that, that argument doesn't go very far with me. But uh, but a second that, point on that. The, but, but it's relevant context because if you're trying to unravel motivation and truth, and that was what likely happened here. In my view, you need to look at, okay, what's their motivation? What's their modus operandi? And the reason why I think Adam's point is good is uh, it's two things. One, the fact that he has independent wealth means he didn't need to do it for the money. So then the question is, is there something in his character? The thing is, Bannon has been around tons of places where you could abscond money. He was heavily involved in Wall Street, heavily involved in Hollywood. They've put him under investigation now for years. They tried to go after him for voting issues several years ago uh, because that's another administrative kind of weakness of him. It'd be like Steve Bannon to be registered in three places and not realize it. Um, the He had every opportunity to do so. When I, when I start a case and someone's accused him of tax fraud or other fraud, I look at their whole history. Because if 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 they're guilty, it will show up elsewhere almost without failure. They'll they'll have employees that don't like them. They'll have other people that will have accused them of fraud. There'll have been some other con. There'll have been there'll be a history of problems. It is extremely rare that you are economically successful, have no problems, no allegations ever in twenty years where you had multiple opportunities to divert money and put your own pocket, and now suddenly you do it. Uh, that's the part I'm deeply skeptical of. Now that plays into the third part. If you understand Steve Bannon has his hat, he has his hand in 20 different operations and activities at one time. He's that kind of guy. Uh, he's disorganized, does not have a, a tight knit administrative operation, never has. It's always been a huge weakness of his um, in certain contexts. Uh, and the once you know that, what I suspect happened is that is that money, at least as to his part, He's moving a lot of different money around, and I suspect he'll be able to show, and I'll get into why the indictment actually accidentally reveals this, that he, the, that he was using separate sourced funds for to pay the to pay Colfage and other people. But he did not realize that any of those funds could be traced to build the wall funds, that he was not intending that at all. The uh, And the giveaway here is how vague. Now, let me go into the core part. If I knew nothing about this backstory, I would be telling you this case is bogus just by the indictment itself. And the reason for that is, is knowing what should be there. For people that are, you read the indictment, 
who haven't done a bunch of criminal white collar fraud cases in the States, people like Will Chamberlain and others. The indictment sounds persuasive. It's only if you know what's not there that you understand how problematic it is where the evidence is likely leading to that they're hiding. So to give an example, years ago, I, I took over a case in Atlanta. Construction businessman and his father had been railroaded by Sally Yates. If everybody remember Eternal <laughs> Truth, Sally Yates is corrupt. Um, and the, I mean, they do the degree of bad. Con now, what I did is well, I'll take a look at a, say, a memorandum of interview. And I'll break down every single thing on that piece of paper. There's actually a bunch of great people on the Internet who've been doing this in the Spygate context. Uh, people like Tracy Beans, people like uh, uh, Brian Cates, uh, a wide range of people. Sometimes I disagree with where the cases are going with them, but they do great breaking down data because, uh, information that's available and accessible out there in the public domain. So I'll, I'll break down the codes. I want to know everything. I want to know what that memorandum should look like if it's normally done, what information should be there, how it should be structured, how it should be presented, what codes should be put in the different code entries. Well, just by doing that simple step, I figured out in that case that they had completely doctored and fabricated a bunch of different reports. They had put different pages from different reports together and pretended that they were the same report to build an entirely falsified case against my client. All of his high-end white shoe lawyers, and this is where Steve Bannon may be in trouble. He's got old school Yale white shoe lawyers who will not know how to defend this case, in my view. Uh, they, they don't understand political cases and how to approach them. Probably why they're, I mean, this case should have never gone to indictment, in my view, if properly defended pre-trial, but pre-indictment. Um, but you, you go there. And so for, and it's amazing what you can find. It's very hard to tell a lie well over time when you know what the truth should look like. And so... That, that's just a good universal rule for anybody to apply in any case. I'll give another example, Alex Jones' civil defamation case. First thing I do in any defamation case, if I'm defending it or if I'm bringing it, I look at what's in quotes. Ignore all the things that are not in quotes because that, that stuff that the person didn't say. They're trying to infer it, imply it, et cetera. What did they actually say? Because that's what defamation is, is what did you actually say? And you find in the Alex Jones lawsuits that almost none of the lawsuit has anything that Alex Jones actually said in quotes in it. It's all about other, their interpretation, extrapolation, suggestion, innuendo. The actual number of statements and quotes are very, very small. And then you realize that's what they're hiding. The problem is their case doesn't have core facts needed for defamation under constitutional standards because what's in quotes doesn't constitute constitutionally cognizable defamation. So that's just another example. So I've done a bunch of fraud cases. Here's what you should have in a fraud case. And here's what they always do in a good fraud case. One, they highlight the victim up front. They have multiple victims. They include them in the indictment They uh, the because they, they usually include exhibits that go with it, uh, like uh, emails, uh, videos, testimony, excerpts, uh, things of that nature. And they tightly tie in the statement to the donation or the money. In other words, and they give specific dates. They say on this date, this person said this to that person who heard that and based on hearing that gave money and would not have given the money had that occurred. Uh, had they been truthful. That's a tight, clean, neat fraud case. And you show every example where that occurred. You also, if there's amounts of money you're saying are diverted, you're specific. I guarantee you they've done a full accounting here. They have all the bank and financial records. So, and, and they're more clear. They're like this money on this day transferred from this account to this one. The next day it transferred from here to here. The next day it was spent on this item. The, and so you have neat tracing, not tracing by innuendo, where you're like, this person has a boat. They also got money over here. Well, and oh, now, maybe and they bought the boat with it. Actually, and, and just an interesting uh, interjection is, you know, the cosmetic surgery, uh, it's ambiguous in that uh, Colfage is a, is a triple amputee. Cosmetic surgery might mean something very different for him than what we take it to mean on its face. I mean, but we are getting into the, the grounds of the defense. Like, I have no doubt Bannon's going to say, if you guys want that million, it's still in this 501c4, my separate one. Uh, we've we've earmarked it or whatever. More money comes in there from other from other outlets. So the money coming in from we build the wall was not necessarily the money going out to Colfage for whatever the reason. Um, but that's the point. In the indictment, they always rule that out in these cases. It is extremely rare that they bring an indictment that doesn't have that button down. And I guarantee you they have all the financial records. So that's where I would say, like, what's missing from this indictment is any victim, which is unheard of. If you're going to bring a fraud case, have a victim. The Otherwise, what you're doing is you're saying, well, he made us, he overpromised. 
And hypothetically speaking, that overpromise could have impacted someone's decision. That's not a fraud case. A fraud case is on this day, you told George this, based on you telling George this, he gave you money and he wouldn't have otherwise. And I'll get to why they already know they're screwed on that part, aside from the fact there's no victim in there. Um, and we'll get into how this case has absolutely no business in the Southern District of New York. That's oh, the yeah, most well, you know, constitutional I, but Before we get there, I'm going to screenshot here. Um, just in a nutshell, explain to people, I sort of understand why Southern District of New York is passed off as being totally corrupt. But if you can explain to someone who has no idea why it has the reputation it has in a nutshell. Here's the best examples. The Southern District of New York uh, brings more political high profile cases than anybody. But magically, there are often people that are uh, of low profile or political stature within their local community, or they're not even from there. So by contrast, where are the greatest financial criminals in the entire world located? They're located in the Southern District of New York, and it's called Wall Street. Magically, the Southern District of New York has never criminally prosecuted a major Wall Street bank in, in any recent memory. Magically, everybody involved in all the big short scandals documented in the book and the movie Big Short, nobody got prosecuted in the Southern District of New York or by the District of Manhattan or by the New York Attorney General. They all walked. So the the reason why the Southern is uh, uh, the whole t I'll recommend the, uh, for TV book recommendations, the great series Billions. I happen to know back the whole backstory in part about that because years ago I was approached by some people who wanted to prevent a big Wall Street billionaire from buying uh, a baseball team, Major League Baseball team, and they wanted me to do an analysis about whether this person was under criminal investigation because there were rumors that he was. So I was able to look and pierce together from available information uh, on court dockets and other intel, that yes, he was, that he was clearly a high-profile target. I also told them that I didn't believe Preet Bharara would bring any charges because Preet Bharara is terrified of losing. And the and and not surprisingly, he brought no such cases. But he was, and it later came out, he was under criminal investigation, but that he also, that he would walk, and he did walk. The TV show Billions is all based on that story. Now, they've taken it in a wide range of different directions, but that's why it's about a famous federal New York prosecutor played by Paul Giamatti, who is loosely based on Preet Bharara, uh, and the billionaire character is loosely based on the billionaire, I won't name, it, name him, but uh, you can figure it out if you Google. The, uh, and so that gives a backstory. So the Southern District of, and the, how they portray things in billions, I tell people that are in criminal defense cases that are clients of mine or potential clients, I tell them, watch the show and you will understand how the criminal justice process works. Watch Ray Donovan to figure out how the court of public opinion works in some of these kind of cases. Watch both and you really get an understanding. Ray Donovan spent several years in the, uh, based in New York. Uh, starts out in LA, go to New York. Also accurately portrays what really goes on in New York. So the reason why New York is perceived as corrupt is because they bring cases that often smack of political motivation. They like the Martha Stewart case where she actually didn't do insider trading. They just set her up in a bad interview uh, and, and her white shoe law firm screwed up by letting her sit there and go through that interview and answer questions mistakenly. Uh, the Leona Helmsley case still has deep problems with it. So the, as a whole, they're known for bringing high profile cases, but magically target people outside the political process. And while the big, big people in New York, particularly Wall Street, the institutional players never get hit. It's not a coincidence in recent years. It's been because of the very peculiar behavior of the Southern District of New York, com contrasting the Clinton related cases and Trump related cases. In the Clinton related cases, New York Attorney General never brought a single prize. There's put it this way. There's a reason why when Clintons leave the White House. They don't go back to Arkansas. They don't go other place or Illinois, where she's from. They go right to Manhattan because they know they're never going to be prosecuted for anything in Manhattan. So not by the Manhattan DA, not by the Southern District of New York, not by the New York Attorney General, even though all of them have jurisdiction over the Clinton Foundation, which is the source of all the pay for play scandals. The Clinton, the, all of the activities involving Clinton emails have a strong nexus to New York. It's New York who stumbles on Anthony Weiner's laptop, which has Clinton Foundation, Clinton emails that she'd been hiding from public view that the D.C. Circuit just recently said she doesn't have to get deposed on. So that's the backstory of what the Southern District, and by contrast, the Southern District of New York has put almost anybody connected to Trump under criminal investigation. They let Michael Cohen walk off of on real scandals just so he'll say bad things about Trump. They go after, uh, I'll give, here's another example. In the Mueller case, the Tony Podesta 
did worse was actually the boss, effectively, of Paul Manafort, involving all the things that Manafort, they tried to get Flynn and that Turkish guy who ended up walking on, uh, which was all the lobbying related to Turkey and other activities. Tony Podesta was neck deep in that. In fact, he was the top guy in it. Magically, he doesn't get prosecuted. Mueller, for CYA purposes, guess where he sends the case? Southern District of New York, knowing it will get buried there very effectively. So uh, so while, while Trump is tall, his tax returns are being subpoenaed by the Manhattan DA, the New York Attorney General did a massive investigation into Trump's uh, foundation, and they end up shutting it down rather than deal with the harassment from New York. New York Attorney General is doing a very similar case against the NRA. Another claim where, oh, you're violating the rules by which these people gave donations to when all the donors are not complaining. So that's the history of the Southern District of New York. That's problem one. Problem two is they have had a bad history that they're accelerating of reaching outside of their jurisdiction. So venue, for people who don't know, is a constitutionally based doctrine. Now, unfortunately, our courts have mostly absconded from enforcing it because what courts in the Southern District of New York uh, want to give up power over these high profile political cases? So they won't say, to give you some illustration, I complained about this years ago. First time I complained about it actually was the uh, World Cup case. So there was a bunch of corruption involving World Cup officials. That's that, that's all that's been true for forever. Problem is, it had nothing to do with the Southern District of New York. Almost all the activities took place by foreigners in, in Switzerland or in their home countries. But the Southern District of New York somehow brings a prosecution. How? How are they the world's policemen? They believe that, by the way. They believe if they see something wrong anywhere in the world, because there could be some tangential, tiny connection to New York, they can bring a prosecution. The reason why we don't allow that for venue purposes is, one, we don't consider it fundamentally fair for you to be tried outside of your home community. It's vicinage in the old uh, word, an old, ling old English language. Uh, and that's why venue is constitutionally protected, or it's supposed to be. It's in the Constitution. The courts just miss it, skip it. Uh, but the, the second component is we don't want politically motivated prosecutions. The, we don't want people, we don't want a small prosecutor. Let's say Roy Moore became the uh, U.S. attorney for the Northern District of uh, Alabama or became the state prosecutor for the attorney general. We don't want him saying, you know what, I, I think Barack Obama is illegally in the White House. I think he faked his birth certificate. I'm going to bring criminal charges against him here in Alabama in front of a Republican conservative jury. We don't want that to happen. We want people to only be prosecuted in their home community who have a political tie and connection to that community, both to defend their rights and because we're vindicating the community that's actually at interest. The Southern District of New York has no meaningful nexus to this case. Their only claim is there's a few people who live there who made donations, but they don't claim that any of those people say that they would not have made the donation, but for these facts that they're alleging. So the, uh, so in the, just, and that's just like the NRA. Um, so the, I don't believe Southern District of New York has any venue here. I think it's a violation of the constitutional venue provisions. Uh, I mean, I argued this obviously personally back in the Wesley Snipes case where they tried him in Ocala, Florida, when he had never been to Ocala. Well, they tried a bunch of eight of his uh, people that, that were involved in that, that they called co-conspirators. They tried them all up in the District of Columbia. So they try the hillbillies in District of Columbia, and they try West in the per capita capital of racial hatred incidents. That's what kind of fraud the federal government can be when they want to abuse the venue provisions. And this is one of the most egregious. Another example, a couple of years ago, the Southern District of New York brought a charge against gun runners. The fascinating thing was, was, like, was the gun runners were from Eastern Europe. They were giving guns to a Colombian rebel group and had no connection to New York at all. The people weren't connected. No transaction was connected. No financial transaction, no gun trading. And really, it was frankly a political dispute. It was whether the East Europeans happened to agree with the Colombian rebels. Why in the world is that the Southern District of New York's business? But they love to grab power in federal courts or loves to enhance that power. So the so that's the reality of the Southern. So who is bringing the prosecution is a major problem to me right off the bat. And you're, you're talking Strauss or Berman? Uh, I, in this case, I'm talking uh, Strauss. Well, I'm talking the whole Southern District of New York, okay. the Southern District of New York and the District of Manhattan. I got a current case against the District of Manhattan, so I'll, I'll be more polite. But the uh, uh, I'll put it this way. If 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 you get into a fight over dog walking and bird watching anywhere in America other than the District of Manhattan, or if your politics were on the different side of the aisle, uh, Amy Cooper's not prosecuted anywhere else. She's only prosecuting the District of Manhattan for politicized purposes. And I won't get into what some of the police officers that are aware of the case think, but let's just put it this way. They wouldn't have been the one to bring the case. So the, the case is being brought for politicized purposes because that's what they do in New York. I, I really encourage people to watch the documentary on the Abacus Bank. 
a great little Chinese American, set up a wonderful little bank for the Chinese community in New York City. Uh, and it's just like this case because they have people making inaccurate statements in the uh, loan applications, but it caused no harm. The, the Fed, nobody was complaining. What happened was people had illegal source income and couldn't say that. So they had to say their income was over here rather than over there. Uh, and so the, they couldn't, uh, and, but they all paid back their loans. They had a lower failure rate than every other Wall Street bank. And yet they get criminally prosecuted for the Wall Street bank fraud. It was ridiculous. Uh, but the, now luckily they were able to win that case with some excellent, excellent New York old school defense lawyers. Uh, but that's, that, that's who they are in New York. It's, everything is political. They're politically motivated. They politically tarnished, uh, in the way they bring their cases. And they're the worst, they're in my view, the most corrupt federal prosecutors unit in America. Uh, and for people who are wondering whether maybe somebody, I personally am aware of multiple cases, the Southern District of New York is handling, and I won't go into detail of those cases because they're pre-indictment, where they have nobody complaining and they're targeting people for political purposes um, and purely political. That they, they, they looked at, they said, I don't like that person. What can we go after them for? And this is the old Berea rule uh, where Berea told Stalin, you don't worry about the crime. Show me the man and I'll find you the crime. And that's my other point broader about the context of the industry. If I put anybody in America under microscopic review, I can find something in your life I call criminal because we do find there's the laws are all over the place. And if you're in any kind of financially complicated enterprise, guaranteed. And if you're dumb enough to try, I told people not to open 501c4s, 501c3s out of the gate, by the way, these things are not even being approved by the IRS for a year plus. So the uh, it, it's you're wasting your time with it. The only reason you would do it is it makes it a tax deductible a deduction, but nobody really in the in the people build, spending build a wall didn't care about that. Quick quick uh, question: What's the difference between a five hundred one c three and a five hundred one c four? Cernovich asked uh, Colfage the question in the interview, and I didn't I didn't know the answer. It's different activities and different regulations, but okay. huge traps in all of them. Huge trap. That's why I found fascinating. I was like, okay, if there was truly malfeasance here, you always include. 501c violations. It is so easy. I mean, the, the number of the people don't even understand how strict those things are. The, uh, I mean, you can't have anything they call self-dealing in those transactions, anywhere close to it. Not a single self-dealing allegation. That means that the money trail doesn't lead where they say it does, and that's why it's vague. My guess is that they have inferences. This money went here, and this money over here was spent there. We're going to connect the two, even though we didn't properly trace it. And could because there, there's some huge flaws sitting in this case evidentiary because of what's not being alleged in the indictment. Now, here's my other, my biggest problem with the case is who is bringing it. They have no business being bringing it. And, they have, and, and all the evidence in the world is that it's politically motivated. Sa Second, save, save and except for the allegation in the indictment specifically there to the effect that some of the donors were from the Southern District of New York. Or yeah, but by that standard, every everybody everywhere can bring prosecutions now. If you have any financial tie in any way, shape or form, any contributor tie, donor tie, that means any, any prosecutor's office anywhere in the world, in America, can bring a charge because there's going to be some financial personal connection at, at, to any global enterprise the, the that's what they're asserting the, the the problem is they're they're not from there their operation wasn't based there they didn't do the banking there they didn't do most of the finance they didn't do any of the organizational bases there the wall is, ain't being built in new york not yet at least maybe time it should be the uh escape from la style but the uh so th this is does not fit the definition of proper venue they also likely do not have a proper factual predicate this I'll, I'll guarantee you this did not come about because somebody complained to them. This came about because they decided to voluntarily do it on their own accord. Now, the second problem I have with it, when, why are they bringing this charge right on the eve of the Republican National Convention, right as Bannon is getting back in the game of advising Trump? Yeah. Isn't that an amazing coincidence? Now, now let me give you my big overarching claim. Uh, I mean, if I was the lawyer on this case, I'd be torching everybody. But by the way, one of these prosecutors is, the Ghislaine Maxwell prosecution. So anybody having any hope that the Ghislaine Maxwell prosecution goes anywhere other than accuse Republicans can kiss it goodbye. Because if she's involved with this case, that means that case is going to be politically corrupted and contaminated as well. No surprise. Maybe she's really in there for the same reason Epstein was locked up, which is the second eternal truth to everybody. Epstein did not kill himself. <laughs> the, uh, so the, but yeah, so I have huge problems with the case. I know that it's uh, different than a lot of other people's opinions out there, but it's based on who is bringing it, when they're bringing it, and the fact that I've done tons of these cases, and this is the weakest mail fraud case. I mean, I've defended people accused of Ponzi schemes 
few of them maybe you know well the jury said a few of them were guilty the uh uh so the uh and some of them were you know got screwed up in the rest but i know what a strong case looks like i know what a weak case looks like this is the weakest case i've ever seen and who is bringing it and when they bringing it make me believe it's politically contaminated one last fact here's the other giveaway on this case in january what i found fascinating was they took key exculpatory facts and twisted them into incriminatory facts which is always the sign of a corrupt prosecution in my view so sometime in late fall bannon finds out that there's an according to the indictment bannon finds out that they're looking at him looking at this build a wall operation so what you would do if you were let's say you're innocent and here and you're in his position you're like okay hold on they're saying something's criminal well what is it oh, okay that they think how the funding is worth okay the and remember by the way a key fact in the indictment they never identify a single time where Bannon said that the uh, that every single penny, nickel, diamond, dollar would go to the wall. They never had Bannon saying that. In fact, they, there's a Vice interview out there where Bannon says he's kind of a volunteer for it. Well, he says kind of, by the way. It doesn't say full volunteer. But so on that point, it was striking that they only have Colfage making statements. Uh, the And then they don't neatly tie in those statements to a specific person, uh, which is what a fraud case is supposed to be. So uh, another key component to all of this is that uh, in the indictment, in terms of uh, the Bannon aspect of all of this, the oh no no I, I'm, I'm an idiot I keep swiping myself out of the damn <laughs> <laughs> that's right no problem so the, uh, oh it, it, it is that the fact they don't tie Bannon in is is, is going to be a critical fact I think in time I think it means it's not clear but what Bannon, what does Bannon do when he he let's say you're innocent and you find out oh maybe I maybe there's a screw up here. Money went to him. I guess he wasn't supposed to get any money or whatever. If you're Steve Bannon, for example, because they don't tie Bannon into these internal communications about a lot of stuff. Notably, their only tie to Bannon is that Bannon says, "Hey, any deal I want to be, I want to know about." But then they don't say he knew about any of the rest. It, it was yeah. it was an amazing extrapolation. But so back in January, they tell the whole world. By the way, Colfage is getting paid, and there's salaries and compensation coming here. That's eight months ago. The, uh, and so they try to make that into a bad act. My view is that's key exculpatory evidence because you know what? You know what I, I, I'm going to guess is likely the case because it's, again, missing from the indictment. Nobody complained. Nobody asked for a refund. If, they, if the reason they gave was because they thought that magically you, every single penny of a fundraising campaign would never be spent on anything related to fundraising or administration, but would just go to physically building the wall. Assuming that premise, which misunderstands who was giving money in, in, in this context, but putting that aside, why didn't any of them request refunds? They, they've known for eight months that Colfitch was getting paid. So, And yet they turk that and they make that a bad act. Well, the other thing they make is a bad act. Yeah. By the way, for everybody out there, good practical advice, uh, other than always in cash, never in writing, just good advice or Earl, Earl Long's old lesson, just good advice generally to not deal with the government tracking or tracing you in every respect. Uh, but I, my guess is they started to use signal. What I find shocking is that it shows you how clueless Bannon is uh, that he wasn't using this for a much longer signal for those people out there is the most secure app uh, in the world by far. I was introduced to it be, by one of, I can't disclose who, but the, one of the highest ranking government officials who's, responsibility is national security and security of communications. Uh, and he told me about a case related to the Mueller inquiry uh, that he had, he said, I won't talk to you except he needed to talk to me, but he's like, I'm not going to talk to you except with signal. And he was extremely careful about how I mean, he used an intermediary, but so I, I never, there was no track record of me ever talking to him other than on signal. And that's when I realized, wow, signal must be legit. And I'd seen from Snowden and other people that it was good. The reason is this. It's an open source app. It's not corporate controlled, but that's part one. Part two is there's no centralized location. What most people don't know is when you text, there's a centralized location that keeps all of those texts. Now, also, they get bounced up to the NSA and the NSA has them all. But the, the feds don't have normal access to the NSA's database, the echelon system. But they can go to the phone company and get it directly because your texts are stored there, even if you delete it on your own phone and the person receiving it deletes it. So I've told people, if you want secure communications, you must use Signal because Signal has no centralized storage location. They have to physically get your phone in order to, to get it. Um, so the uh, so my view is, based on what's there, I do not see, I believe that based on what's missing from the indictment, 
is that these folks did not set out to defraud anybody. They made, a, a, you know, Kofage made an overstated promise that he should have corrected quicker once it became so complicated, it was going to take up all his time. Uh, and the Bannon took corrective action. I would have, I would have been more aggressive. I would have made sure everybody knew the whole story back in January. Once they realized this was an issue, he would have got tons of people on his side. The sympathy for Kofage is very high because of what yeah, he and that's why, like, you know, I understand the changing of the website is a double-edged sword because some are going to say, yeah, it's an overt act to let people know. Others are going to say, you know, you're changing the small print once the, the boat is in motion and it's not as clear cut as you think it is. Um, you're always better off changing it because, by the way, well, no, I, I would just. It. I would have made a, a massive, a massive yeah, statement yeah. about it, not just you know, not casually no, changing. I'd have done that first. More. I would have offered reruns to anybody upset. We responded, you know, see what happens with sixty days, and then I would have sued the Southern District of New York right after that. I would have gone after him. I would say it's politically motivated. They're going after Trump targets. This is selective prosecution. Yeah. Here, by the way, is the a net effect of this. Steve Bannon has taken out a commission for advising Trump. Trump will keep his distance because of the nature of the case. A lot of Trump's ad uh, Bannon's advice was starting to get better. It had been weak, frankly, bad for a while, but it was starting to get good about core cultural populism. He understands very well. Trump was starting to uh, emulate, imitate, and repeat these trends. They take Bannon out of the picture. Secondly, they send a message, which they've been sending since 2016. If you want to help Bannon, Trump, and you are successful at any level, you are going to be put under microscopic investigation at some point. And unless you have a perfect past, you will be prosecuted. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, and number three, the uh, in terms of the, the timing of when it took place, in terms of what happened, they're also doing trying to do something broader. They're trying to shut down the wall campaign uh, because, by the way, the their ridiculous forfeiture request and how excessive it is. Yeah. OK, so is, and ahead. actually, the re so real bambooga from a while back. I have a screenshot of the chat, but yeah. talk brought up the forfeiture. Uh, regardless of what I think of the of the law, the indictment itself, because I, you know, I have my, I have my, I won't call it a prejudgment at this point. I have my assessment based on one side of the story. I know what the defense is going to be. I know where the gray water is going to be, and I know that I think other entities should have been. If this is the new standard, mm -hmm. and if I think it's deserved in this circumstance, it's got to be ten times more deserved in another circumstance. Yes, correct. Setting all that aside, the 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 forfeiture seems to me like I, I tweeted it out um, uh, today. It's like. We're going we're gonna to indict you. We're going to make allegations that everything you own is the proceeds of the crime you are alleged to have committed. We're going to seize everything you have and now go defend yourself. Innocent until proven guilty, but you've got nothing to do it with. Oh, exactly. I mean, forfeiture law has always been problematic. It's ironic that they're again using it when the left is complaining about forfeiture laws. Um, forfeiture laws have been a problem for many years. 20 years ago, I was at a, uh, actually a little more than 20 years ago, special conference at Howard University where a young African-American brought up the problem of civil forfeitures in rural Kentucky. I investigated it and was shocked by it. I've tried to bring laws in different contexts about it. Uh, I brought peonage challenges where they're trying to basically imprison people for debt in some of these contexts. I've challenged forfeitures whenever I can. They need to be challenged continuously and more broadly. What people don't realize, the government can come and steal your stuff without ever actually convicting you of a crime. That's the problem. And, and, and people should appreciate even an acquittal doesn't necessarily get your forfeiture back. That's exactly right. That's number one. Number two, they have a habit of seizing more than they can trace. So what they're going to do here, and this is why also they're being vague in the indictment. Like you notice they said Steve Bannon used it for personal expenses. Well, how much? I guarantee you there's an internal accounting. That number must be so low or for some reason look bad or because they want to grab more than they can or should for forfeiture purposes. Because here's what's going to happen. They're going to seize all the build the wall forfeiture funds. They already have. So you think they're going to build the wall with it? Don't think so. Southern District of New York. Secondly, they're going to use this as an excuse to find out all the donors to build the wall. And they're going to find there's some big donors, by the way, um, some legally and financially sophisticated ones. And, and they're going to target them. So you, you, just like the New York Attorney General is using her NRA suit to get the name of every single NRA donor in the country, the Southern District of New York is using this case to freeze and end forever, build the wall. Secondly, to get all the donations, to find out who donated to build the wall, all their names, all their identification. Uh, I do not trust them to go to not go further. I know they are doing this in other cases. They're trying to get customer lists, trying to get donor lists, trying to get contributor lists for the purposes of targeting them. This goes way back, by the way. In the 1940s, they used to use petition, whoever signed a petition for certain candidates, they would put them on blacklist to call them communists or anything else. So there's a long history of them. Uh, the uh, state of Alabama, before the Southern District of New York used this tactic, 
State of Alabama was doing it in the 1950s and 60s, trying to figure out who was donating to the NAACP to put them on a list. The U.S. Supreme Court said that actually was protected information, hasn't stopped them from abusing their power in the criminal context. So the, the criminal context is just unchecked power, unfortunately. And when it's in a, as politicized as the Southern District of New York, the District of Manhattan, uh, and the state of New York, then you, you can be put under the gun. So the uh, so that they're doing that. Say, and the third, I believe, political goal with this is to terrify conservatives from making contributions to conservative right wing causes. So they've already been waging war on Patreon to not support certain uh, conservatives, selective censorship, overnight removal. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, doing the same thing, of course, on Medium and another. They've done it frequently on GoFundMe. There's certain conservative causes that have not been allowed to raise funds. GoFundMe has forfeited funds in certain contexts, refused to allow the funds to be spent for the cause that people contributed to. Uh, so the uh, th their goal is, what's the net effect of this? Oh, I you know I better not give to that next big concern because it's probably maybe it's a fraud, maybe it's a scam. Because you know it's one thing they did here. They did a good job of using the headline of $25 million as if that's the amount of fraud alleged. The amount of fraud alleged is less than a million. Cause here's the, one of the big giveaways for this folks. Build the wall spent more money on actually building the build a wall than almost any charity or campaign in the country spends on their intended project. So, be, and, and Robert, ju and to, just to push back on that one point, some people sure. are gonna say they did it as cheaply as possible to net as much profit as they can, or I don't know this part, using contractors with whom they have ties to whatever they'll go through the standard sort of rebuttal to that. I don't know what they, people what can they do, do all that, but here's just by what's not alleged in the indictment. The indictment only alleges a million misallocated. Yeah. Um, and so that means 24 million was not. And so the, uh, that means you're talking about a 95%. I can tell people for political campaigns, they spend less than half the money they raise. judicial watch. They, every year, they spend 20 to 25% of their money just on fundraising efforts. So the fact that you gave money to build the wall and it actually went to building the wall at 90 to 95% would be one of the highest rates of actually going to your intended cause of any fundraising effort in the country in that the past is, five years. That there's no question about it. First of all, I mean, you actually sort of just did blow my mind, not improving the innocence of the defendants based on the indictment, but rather just the politicized nature of this all of those things. I mean, you're right with the NRA going, getting the list of donors. You can anticipate that being a concern in this freezing up whatever's left of the funds. I assume if they spent enough of it on the wall, there's hopefully, you know, not much left that the government's going to seize and y y waste on its own. But th another thing people don't know when you uh, post money in court, for example, just in a civil suit, the court takes, I don't know, anywhere between like an eight to 12 percent administration fee of that amount. So you want to screw somebody or be a jerk, make them deposit the money in court. You're going to waste 10% of it on a year, you know, regardless. So the idea that the government's going to do anything less than waste this on its own, even after having seized it is enraging enough. Correct. But well, it, and that'd be part of my defense. If I was in the court of public opinion or is it trial say the, I guarantee you they spent more money on building the, uh, on what they're supposed to do than the government ever will with this money. Not only in terms of the government has no interest in building the wall, the Southern district of New York doesn't, but the the Southern District of New York's administrative fees on the on the monies it forfeits uh, on the receivers it get receiverships it gets assigned to on its bankruptcy proceedings nowhere near ninety ninety five it does it stay less than ten percent um, so that's why I've, it's like Abacus case because the Abacus case I was like hold on a second the fraud we're worried about is people getting loans who couldn't pay it back and it turns out these guys paid back loans at a higher rate. So you're arguing about, well, there's some inaccurate statements made and there's inaccurate affidavits. I was like, but it's not really material. It doesn't. That's not why we have these criminal laws. Um, and it, this it struck me the exact same way. The other the arguments I would make is, let's say they were sincerely concerned. They really thought people gave money because they didn't understand uh, and, and, and somehow didn't realize when they were not getting complaints or going out and talking to people, not getting them to go along. That, that meant their theory was wrong. But let's put all that aside. Let's say they really thought this was a serious problem. There's a proper way to do it. You would refer to the IRS for civil investigation of whether or not there's been an appropriate uh, handling of the monies within the 501c4. And secondly, you would refer it to the actual venue that has jurisdiction over the case. So in the Steve Bannon's case, it'd be Florida. And I don't know where Colfitz lives. I think it's Texas. You'd, you'd transfer it there. The fact that they didn't tells you that they don't actually have confidence that an independent prosecutor would agree of the criminal worthiness of their case. Um, because otherwise they would happily do so because that's the proper protocol. I guarantee you the Southern District of New York would go nuts if Texas or Florida decided to usurp New York cases from New York.
of New York defendants. So the uh, it's, a, it's, it's a deeply problematic case. Uh, I mean, you've done a good video that shows a part of the kind of the other side. Will Chamberlain, if people want to see it, he presents the other side from my side of the equation. Uh, I'm just saying that from my personal experience, this is a case that would not be brought other than political motivation. And I think at a minimum, it's exaggerated charges and a misuse of prosecutorial resources. And uh, I think down deep, I, it, it, let's say I'm right, that it just turns out it's administrative financial screw ups that, that Bannon just didn't make easy clear that this was separated from this and this was separated from this. Uh, if I'm right, then they really don't have a case. Uh, the way well, Bannon's acting, he's acting like he doesn't believe, he believes he has some aces in the hole. Now, flip side, uh, Bannon's naive. Uh, Mueller rolled him with ease. Uh, and he has a white shoe lawyer, and, and I, I just don't trust any white shoe lawyer criminal defense case. I don't know this particular one, so I'm not saying anything negative about him personally. I'm just saying I don't trust white shoe law firms to know how to defend political cases. You get Roger Stone and General Flynn's original case outcome when you hire white shoe firms more often than not. They don't know how to wage war. They're usually scared to do so. They're usually friends and allies with the prosecutors on the other side, so they don't want to upset their little cocktail party at Man in, in the Hamptons next summer. Um, I don't have that fear. So I would be throwing grenades every which way. Bannon's personality would be to would do that. Uh, but I'm not seeing it yet. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. But I am big, more worried about the broader consequences of this case, not only over criminalizing behavior that can be remedied in other ways, but also in what it means for forfeitures and what it means in the conservatives, people on the right's ability to fundraise, things of this nature. I think it will have a very detrimental impact that again, it's the left weaponizing the legal process and the prosecutorial process to gain a political edge, and they will gain it from this.